Real World Foundation. I'm a sophomore at Carnegie Mellon University, majoring in artificial intelligence. And here at KWF, I work on image recognition with the AI team. So let's get started. So here's some video footage of the beach. Um, you may notice a few things. The ocean on the left, perhaps, some tire tracks, some of the green plants on the, both the left and the right. Um, but what's the most important here is the occasional sighting of turtle tracks, as you see that passed right there. Um, you'll probably be able to see a few more in this video. And what the KWF AI team really wants is for a drone to be able to see this too. So if a drone flies over the sand like it is right now, um, we want it to be able to detect the turtle tracks that pass by. So as you can see, some of the turtle tracks just passed by over there. Um, and there are different turtle tracks that we want to detect as well. So let's introduce the project that I'm working on. So Michelle is a drone that is intended to gather valuable data about sea turtles to be sent to biologists. We do this using artificial intelligence, namely object detection with turtle tracks. And we'd like to gather locations of turtle tracks and turtle nests, their conditions and more. I'm not working on the hardware of the drone, so what I focus on is the artificial intelligence aspect. We want the drone to be able to do a few things when presented a video of the beach like we saw on the previous slide. Michelle should be able to see and locate any turtle tracks on the beach. It also has the added requirement of being able to tell which species of turtle made those tracks. As you'll see later, different types of turtles make different types of tracks. Um, and those could be kind of hard to tell apart, so we want the drone to be able to get good at differentiating them. And finally, the drone should have a way to gather and send location data. And this should all be done in real time, meaning that the drone should be able to do all of these things while it flies over the beach. Um, I'm particularly focusing on the first two requirements, um, making the drone see turtle tracks and differentiate the uh, tracks between different species. The gathering and sending GPS location data has more to do with integrating the software with the hardware of the drone. So here's uh, an overview of what we'll be covering in this webinar today. First, I'll be talking about the tools I've used and the process of detecting turtle tracks. Then I'll stop for questions to see if you have any uh, regarding what I've talked about so far. Then I'll talk about the results and the challenges that the AI team has had. And finally, I'll give a summary and conclusion of what my internship experience has been like. And then I'll stop for questions again. Um, so I'd appreciate if you could save any questions for one of those two Q&A sessions. Okay, uh, let's get started. So first, here are the tools that I've been using throughout this um, project. Um, we've been using image data, YOLO, Google Colab, and Label IMG. And I'll be giving more details about each of these in the coming slides. So first, we have image data, which are basically pictures of turtle tracks. We have received many images of turtle tracks from Mexico to be used as data for the project. On the top, you can see an example of green turtle tracks. Um, and the image on the bottom is an example of tracks made by a hawksbill turtle. Um, as you can see, these tracks of these two species are quite distinct, but sometimes they can be hard to tell apart. So from the examples you've seen in the previous slide, let's try to figure out what type of turtle made these tracks. Was it hawksbill or green? Feel free to type your answers in the chat. I see green so far. Any other? Hawksbill? So thanks for the people who have participated. Um, these are actually Hawksbill tracks. So if you look back at the first example of Hawksbill tracks that we saw, you may notice that the tracks of the Hawksbill tracks alternate. Um, so if you can see on the bottom image right there. Um, and here is a more um, clear pattern of how the Hawksville tracks look like. Um, 
This is because Hopsville turtles alternate their steps, so their traps are not symmetrical. It may not be as clear in this uh, image, but you can definitely see the wavy lines between the uh, tracks too. And on average, Hawksville tracks tend to be narrower than green tracks because Hawksville turtles are smaller in width. Let's try another example. What type of turtle made this track? Feel free to type your answers in the chat. I see a lot of greens. Any more responses? Yeah, there are a lot of greens, and that is correct. Um, these are green tracks, and the tracks of green turtles are characterized as the symmetrical um, paired line tracks. This is because instead of walking one flipper at a time, green turtles drag themselves across the sand with both flippers at the same time. Uh, and their tails end up making marks in the middle of the tracks as well, as you can see in the lines in the middle. Uh, and on average, green turtle tracks tend to be wider than hostile tracks. So uh, I hope that was a fun exercise to give you more experience in um, differentiating these tracks. And now you can see that this is a task that um, we want our drone to be able to do. So the next uh, tool that I've used is YOLO stands for you only look once. It's a real-time object detection system and uh, that means that when given an image or a video in real time it should be able to detect the objects that we want it to detect. Um, we chose YOLO because the newer versions, uh, specifically YOLO version 4 which is what we're using, um, are considered to be some of the most accurate and efficient object detection systems. Um, as you can see on the chart on the right, um, this compares different object detection systems with YOLO version 4 and green. Um, on the vertical axis is AP, which is average precision. It's basically a performance measure of how well the CNN did. A higher number is better. And on the horizontal axis, there's FPS, which is frames per second of a video. So this graph basically shows how well these object detection systems do when run on videos with different frame rates for the same data set, which is called MS Coco. Um, and you can see that YOLO version 4 consistently does better than the others when given a higher to medium uh, frame per second. Um, YOLO uses a convolutional neural network, um, which is basically characterized by many layers followed by a neural network. Um, the first layer is the input layer, where the images and labels, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, get inputted. Then you have the convolutional layers, which extract defining features of input images, such as edges, colors, and more. Um, and note that more layers um, allow for more complex features to be extracted. Um, then you have pooling, which basically reduces the size of the data in order to reduce the computational power needed to analyze it. Um, this is pretty important because sometimes you have lots and lots of images um, which can get pretty expensive to analyze. Finally, we have the fully connected layer, which is a neural network consisting of nodes and connections with weights that determine how strong the connections are. Um, this is basically the main backbone of how um, the CNN tells where the objects are in it. The next tool is Google Colab. While most of the other interns on my team use a Google Cloud virtual machine to train and test Yellow CNN, I've been using Google Colab. Um, this is pretty uh, convenient to access free graphical processing lips. Um, and GPUs are really important to speed up image processing, which I've already mentioned that's very important when using a CNN. Um, and the image on the bottom just shows an example of a Google Colab environment. Now I'll um, go more into the process of detecting turtle tracks. So we have three main um, parts, which is labeling, training, and testing. So labeling um, is the first step to detecting the turtle tracks. The purpose of that is to provide the CNN with examples of what green and hot turtles look like. Our hope is that the CNN will be able to look at these examples and then use them to learn how to identify new tracks. The tool we used for this was called Label IMG. And basically what we did were, was manually draw bounding boxes on the images that contained the turtle tracks. Um, the data was saved as text files with locations indicating where the boxes were. 
And these are the labeling files that the CNN will take in as inputs. Now here's a general process of training a neural network. Um, so we already have labels and images as training data. So that data will be run through the CNN. The output of the CNN will be the location of any turtle tracks, if there are any. Um, then the predicted locations and the actual locations provided by the training data are compared. This shows how well the CNN did because the labels that we provided as training data are the true locations of the track. We want the predictions to be as close to the true values as possible. Then the weights are adjusted in the network so that it will be more accurate next time. This process is repeated several times, usually thousands of predictions. So with YOLO, um, the training process was basically setting up the configuration of the CNN. Um, we already had um, a configuration of the CNN that was provided to us, um, but we just changed it with editing the number of categories we had, which was the number of turtle species, so two, and other par parameters. Then we uploaded our training images and labeling data. We uploaded testing images and more information so that we had all the um, tools needed to run the training. And then uh, the training was just running a simple command that we were getting uh, to run YOLO. And the images are basically pictures of outputs that we got while training. Um, you might have a question about when we stop training. So we stop training when the average loss, which is a measure of the difference between predicted and actual locations, stops changing a lot. But we have to make sure that we don't train it for too long because that might lead to overfitting the training set. This means that the CNN gets too dependent on specific properties of the training set, which is especially problematic when the training set is not fully representative of the conditions that you want to test the CNN in. So there's a balance to be found in training the CNN enough so that it's as accurate as possible, but not overfitting. The next process is testing. And how we do that with YOLO is just running a simple command and entering paths to test images. Um, note that we want the images that we test with to be completely new and different images that, than what we trained with. Because if we tested images that we trained with, um, the results would always be perfect uh, because the CNN already knows the correct answer as it has the labeling data. So we test with new images to see how uh, CNN would behave with data it hasn't seen before. The image on the left um, of the track with the bounding box shows what a prediction looks like uh, in an outputted image. This basically shows that the CNN found a green turtle track in that location within the box. So that was a lot of information. Um, do any of you have any questions about what I've talked about so far? Feel free to enter it in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, first question I received was, how is the data collected about the turtles applied slash use? Um, so I'm assuming you're referring to the image data. Um, and we were basically given that data from a partner in Mexico. So we didn't collect the data ourselves. Um, if you had a different question than what I talked about, feel free to um, clarify. Um, the next question, what's the most difficult part of labeling data? So um, as you can see um, in some of the turtle images we've gotten, um, these are not hard objects that you can put a bounding box around the entire thing. Um, sometimes you might be able to because the tracks go horizontally, um, but that's not always the case as you can see like in an example like this. So we have to make bounding boxes that go diagonally and sometimes that means that the bounding box don't cover the entire track, um, which might make it a little harder to for the CNN to be able to detect it because it's a pattern that we're detecting, not an object. But um, otherwise, labeling was 
pretty self-explanatory and wasn't super difficult with the tool we were using. Any other questions? I had a, I had a quick question. Um, yeah. First of all, I think this is really cool work that you're doing. Um, Thank you. I guess my question was about how much data you ended up actually labeling yourself. Um, and also you talked about like, obviously in deep learning, there's this balance between, you know, fitting the train set, but not overfitting. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about whether there's issues with like going, like changing sort of the beach, for example, that you're on, like whether you saw issues with uh, like generalizing to different beaches or different locations uh, and how much maybe that would be a problem if you're trying to like get data in Mexico and test this in like Hawaii or something like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you for your question. Um, so remember that we want our training set to basically be representative of the conditions that we want to test in. So if we have training data that is only has one type of beach, one type of lighting, then we should expect to get the best results in the same environment that we were in. So um, right now the images and the videos that we've been testing on um, have been similar, have been in similar environments to the images we've picked. Um, and as you will see in a moment that um, our results that I'll explain later. Um, Sorry, could you remind me of your first question? I think you asked two of them. Oh, my, fir my first question was just about how much data you were training on or you had access to. Oh, right. Um, so we had about 130 images for uh, green turtles and 160 images for hawksbill. Um, so we trained with different amounts of pictures. We trained multiple times to see what would work best. Um, we usually trained about um, 100 of each of those and tested with like 20 or 30. Um, but you'll see um, in the coming slides that uh, we have used other types of images as well. And I'll explain that later. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you so much. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Oh. Um, how much time do you spend on labeling and training per class? Um, so labeling, it doesn't take very long per image. Um, it doesn't really matter on how many classes you have, more on how many images you have. So um, labeling doesn't really take a long time if we don't have too many images to label. Uh, training, um, we can train both classes at, classes at once. So um, it depends on what GPU you're using because that determines how fast the training gets run. Um, but some people spend six hours while some people spend 10 hours. It kind of matters on when you stop. Um, yes. Um, the last question I received was, how many species of turtles has the AI been trained to identify? Um, right now, we're only focusing on hawksbill turtles and green turtles, so only these two. Um, and I think those are the ones we'll be focusing on for this project. Any more questions before I move on? Okay, thanks for all the good questions everyone. Um, now I'll begin to talk about the results and some of the challenges that the AI team has faced while working on this project. So what we first did was started off with training with only one species of turtle, um, just to get familiar with the training process. So I was assigned green turtles and the results turned out in the following way. So as you can see, um, First of all, these are new images from, so th this image was not used in the training process. Um, as you can see, the bounding box has to show where the green turtle tracks are. And uh, this is pretty accurate because it shows that the CNN can detect where the turtle tracks are in an image and it can correctly draw the bounding boxes over. 
Here's another example of some of my results from one class. These are green turtle tracks as well. And this is another example. Um, you can see that it's doing pretty well with um, recognizing turtle tracks of different orientations, such as vertically or diagonally or um, horizontally. So that was good. Um, now that we know that the CNN could accurately detect where the tracks were in a new image, we added the extra task of being able to differentiate between the tracks of the two species. So next, we trained the CNN with data that included both green and Huxwell tracks. Um, not in the same image, though. Um, we had only images that were either green or hot. Um, the results were not as we hoped. And just a note before I show you the results, um, I know that in my previous results images, the purple box indicated a green turtle track, but with training both classes, the CNN outputted green bounding boxes for green tracks and purple bounding boxes for hot tracks. So just keep that in mind. This is an example of a good result that I got. This image contains only green turtle tracks and the CNN outputted the correct location and classifications of those tracks. So yay, <laughs> um, this is what we want. Um, here's another example. These are Hawksville tracks and the CNN correctly outputted the location and classification of these tracks as Hawksville tracks. However, we also got results like this. Um, both of these tracks are green turtle tracks, but as you can see, the CNN got majorly confused between the two species here and outputted two different turtles for different locations of the same track, which isn't good because a green turtle can't suddenly become a hostile turtle in the middle of a track, <laughs> or at least I hope not. Here is another example of an inaccurate classification. In particular, look at the bottom rightmost bounding box. Um, it says that one box is both a green tool track and a hot track at the same time, which again is not possible. Um, so this is pretty inaccurate and what we don't want. Um, about half of the images I tested turned out to have inaccuracies like this. So after trying different things, such as using a different subset of training images, using a different number of training images and training for different amounts of time, we decide to augment our data. Uh, and that here that just um, refers to rotating or flipping the images. And we just focused on rotation here. Uh, we thought it would help increase the accuracy by giving more examples of the tracks at different orientations. Um, what we did was uh, augmented the images, labeled those images, and then used those in addition to our existing training images to train. So we definitely had a lot more images to train with. And here are some of the results that we got. So these are green turtle tracks. Um, and the CNN outputted correctly that these are both sea turtle, green turtle tracks, um, which is good. Here's another example of green turtle tracks only. Um, these are hot turtle tracks. Um, and again, CNN was correct in detecting the tracks and specifying it as Hawksville tracks. And here's another example of an uh, image of Hawksville tracks that the CNN did well on. So um, my results turned out to have an 87% accuracy for green turtles and 97% accuracy for Hawksville. So it wasn't perfect, but it was definitely better. And um, this is because, first of all, we had a larger training set, um, more diverse data because we had uh, images of tracks with different orientations, um, which, of course, give the CNN a better picture of what Hawksville tracks look like, what green trails tracks look like, and the differences between them. And thus that improved the accuracy a little. So remember the video from the very beginning of the presentation? Um, well, here's what we get when, when we tested our trained CNN on it. Um, and yes, the CNN can be tested on videos too. Um, to test the video, we just made some simple changes. We edited files and ran a different command. 
Um, so it was pretty easy to go from testing images to testing videos. Um, as you can see, the CNN found bounding boxes, uh, outputted bounding boxes on the video where it detected turtle tracks. And they could either be green turtle tracks or hot dog turtle tracks. And this was pretty accurate as well. So this was done with the augmented data plus the original data. And here's another short clip of a video that I tested. You can see the green turtle tracks um, passing by there. And some hoxel tracks. So um, here's a short summary of what we've gone through so far. Um, I've covered the process of detecting turtle tracks, which is labeling, training, and testing. Um, the AI team's progress so far is that we've trained a CNN, we got some disappointing results, we tried to increase the detection accuracy, and we did that by training with augmented data. Um, and then we tested on both images and videos. Changing gears a little bit, here's a summary of what I learned from working on this project. So first I learned how to use new tools. Um, for example, I did not know how to use YOLO or I did not know that label IMG existed. I also learned how to use Google Colab when I couldn't use um, the Google Cloud VM. Um, I also learned how to reason about the accuracy or precision of CNN so that we can improve the accuracy of detecting the trail tracks. Um, and of course, I also had to learn how to tell apart the tracks of green and hot turtles. And um, throughout the internship, I've also learned about some sea turtle conservation efforts. So if you think this might be a valuable experience for you, feel free to check out the KWF website, which I'll put up at the end for uh, internship opportunities. So we're on to our final Q&A. Do you have any questions about anything I've talked about so far? Both in both parts of the presentation. What do you do after you find the data about where the different types of turtles are? Um, so for what we were, uh, we were trying to test on images and videos to see how well the CNN is doing. Um, after testing, um, we want to make sure this can be done in real time. So the next step of this project is to um, integrate this with the Raspberry Pi, which will be able to be run on a drone. Um, and that will allow it to be able to run in real time while a drone is being flown over the sand. So right now what we've been doing um, to, we, we've just been trying to see how well we can train the CNN to find these data, uh, find the turtle tracks um so that's basically our job here um i hope that answered your question <laughs> um any other questions you could put it in the chat or unmute yourself too. what do you think the success of the project is um Oh. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'll get back to the uh, success of the project question. Um, the question was meant to be phrased as um, after I'm able to implement the system, how would you go about helping the turtles with this data? Okay. So the purpose of the drone is um, to gather data about. Uh, sea turtles and their nests and their locations. Um, knowing this will be helpful to determine whether the nests have to be moved or not. Um, and this basically helps marine biologists um, 
with sea turtle conservation efforts. Um, but I'm just focusing on the AI part of the. Hey, Melody, uh, I could jump in and answer uh, a sure. question that Arjun had. Um, so Arjun, one of the reasons why we decided to pursue this project was because currently marine uh, biologists or sea turtle biologists, they have to walk the beaches and locate where the tracks are um, and then determine if the turtle laid a nest or didn't lay the nest. And sometimes the turtles lay a nest in an area where the next high tide can wash away the nest. So they have to relocate the eggs from that nest to a safer place. So um, the challenge that uh, sea turtle biologists face all over the world, regardless, regardless of where they are, is the amount of area that they have to cover. So for example, our partner in um, Mexico, which is Pronatora, they have four different beaches that they monitor for six months every single day. And what happens is that they might have two biologists, they sometimes have volunteers, um, and sometimes they don't have volunteers. So they're covering anywhere between 22 miles to maybe like 32 miles of beach of the four beaches that they have. So you can imagine if you have to walk that every single night, that could take a lot of time and you might not even finish walking the entire beach, especially if a lot of turtles laid a nest that night. So uh, one of the things we want to do is be able to help them locate these tracks and give them the location of where they are. So that way, if they have the GPS coordinates, they might be able to uh, start at one location, fly down, let's say, you know, five or 10 miles and know how many nests are to the north versus to the south. I'm just using that as an example for right now. And then they can manage their team better. So let's say you have, uh, you, you start somewhere in the middle, you've got 22 miles, so 11 miles on one side, 11 miles on the other side. But the north side has about 20 nests for that day. Um, and then the south side only has five nests and you have five people that are help, helping that day. So what you can do is manage your team better to say, okay, you know, we have five, team members, we're going to send four people to the north because we've got a lot more nests to cover than we do to the south. So we'll send one person to the south and, and deal with the nests on that side. So this would help speed up the um, detection of where the nests are. It would also help them manage their teams better. And because we're flying above, we can see which nests are more than likely to get washed away during the next high tide. So our goal is to help the biologist and then in turn the biologist will be able to make the efforts on um, helping with sea turtle conservation. Right. I yeah, that was took a, that was a, took a long answer. time, but I, I think that, that that was probably what his question was led to. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, next question. Um, what do you think the success of the project is? Um, do you mean so far or like in general? I mean, since you're actually working on the, on developing the AI, um, mm -hmm. and I think Jonathan had a great question or a statement also, which was, well, our goal is to implement this all over the world and have any biologist have an opportunity to use a drone with this model to help them. So how do you feel about knowing that that's the kind of impact we're looking to make? And based on that, how realistic do you think it is for us to detect green turtles in Hawaii versus Malaysia versus Australia versus Mexico or Costa Rica or even in, in Florida? Yeah, thanks. Um so yeah this this project definitely has like a great impact on sea turtle conservation and um just helping tur sea turtles in general um and i think that's amazing which is why i love working on this project um but i think it's important that if we are trying to make it more global like not just in mexico we need to include more diverse training data um which would be like ideally taken also from those places um, because the environment in Mexico might not 
be the exact same as the environment in Hawaii or um, somewhere else that we're trying to detect green turtles, sea turtle tracks. Um, so I think this project has been quite successful so far if we're testing in Mexico. And if we're testing in somewhere else, we might want to evaluate that environment and see if that environment is close enough to our training data that we have right now, or we could include more training data that is uh, more representative of a more global um, beach uh, environment. Um, what were the accuracy rates before adding augmented data? Um, so I think it was about somewhere from 50 to 70% uh, over all the interns that did this. Um, so yeah, that was <laughs> kind of bad for both turtles, um, which is why we wanted to increase the accuracy to be at least like 90%. I mean, we still have like a way to go. Um, so we're trying to improve the accuracy right now. Um, but yeah, the before adding the augmented data was pretty bad. <laughs> um next question do you think crowdsource sea turtle data could be useful um yeah probably if we didn't um have to source all the data on our own we could definitely get more access to the data that we kind of want um we're also right now trying to generate images um from the current data we have um but we could also consider using uh crowdsource data um, which might be helpful to generating more data and more diverse data that we can't get from just flying over Mexico. Um, next question, could this technology be used for other species of animals too? Um, yes, definitely. Um, this, the standard YOLO um, uh, system has been uh, able to be used with, has already been trained to detect things like dogs and um, people and other objects. But um, we can train our custom objects, which were turtle tracks. Um, so using YOLO could definitely be a tool that could be trained to detect different types of animals. Um, so yes, definitely this technology could be used for other species of animals too. Actually, I could just share one of our other projects really short is the snow leopard yeah. project. So, for example, in the Himalayas, there's 13 countries where they do snow leopard monitoring. And one of the things they do is place camera traps to be able to understand the environment much better. But some biologist has to sit there for hours and hours and hours and go through the SD card images from those camera traps. So one of the things that we're also working on is using YOLO to detect several different species that are found there, birds or yaks or goats or uh, uh, other animals that live in that same snow leopard habitat. So definitely this type of uh, AI modeling can be used for other uh, conservation efforts in other wildlife as well. So good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, Another question, what are you doing to improve the accuracy? Um, so right now we thought that um, we could increase the accuracy by generating a more diverse data set. So uh, currently we had the original images and then the rotated images that we use for augmented training. Um, right now we, we are generating more images with different lightings, um, different like, rotations, uh, and different scalings. So um, this could definitely help to diversify the data set and provide more data for us to use. Um, after we train it again, we'll have to see um, how that improves accuracy, but diversifying the data set is definitely something we're trying to improve the accuracy of our Thank you. Um, yeah. Just, uh, just following up on, Kind of like what you're doing to try to improve the accuracy mm -hmm. um this is more like a, a general like observation or thought when looking at the application of yellow in this setting is like um i see in many ways how it is an object detection task 
but in many ways it also feels somewhat different like it's more of a pathfinding task and like for example when you watch like the real-time video you see it outputting like you know bounding boxes that are like shifting around a lot um or in some of the error cases you would see that like you get a bounding box that's a green turtle next to a hawksbill turtle um which feels again like the sort of like task of assigning a small portion uh of the actual path to a label can become kind of confusing at like a local scale where the model could get confused and say it's a hawksbill at this one point versus you know a green turtle at the other and so i guess i'm wondering and i don't have a ton of experience with like image object detection but i'm curious whether there you know are sort of more like kind of more cross between like some sort of path like finding uh, approach that is like sort of a variant maybe on yolo but like more trying to like you're trying to almost connect like i would almost imagine like a labeled image could be you put like a line or like some some line segments kind of traversing the the middle of that path and then classify like like this is an entire path that's continuous and then classify that as like a green or a hawk spell. yeah thank you for your question um so yeah that was one of the challenges in using yolo because we need to have rectangular bounding boxes for when we label images and of course it outputs rectangular bounding boxes over the image and um yeah you're right this is not really like one object we're trying to more it's more like detecting a pattern and um yeah it would definitely be helpful if we could somehow encup encompass the entire track in an image with just one like box or one uh, location um and i'm not sure yolo definitely can't do that but i'm not sure if there are other object detection systems that can do that um so but I, it's definitely like something that is good to consider when trying to reason about the accuracy of this because um there are no strict like hard bounds where the object is and where it isn't if it's in the middle of a track. Um, yeah. Yeah, one, one thought that I had kind of going off it is like, for example, I know that there's quite a bit of research into like um, annotating like roads, for example, like scene mm -hmm. annotation from like, for example, satellite imagery, which I guess is similar where like the task there is, you know, for example, like annotate a patch of grass as grass, a road, like annotate that as road. Um, I wonder if something like that, where like you have sort of a two level annotation, one is, you know, color in the path and say like, this is a path. And then from that, you could do some sort of classification given this entire path that might help alleviate some like local issues where you get like flipping between Hawksville and Green where like, you know, path gets blown by the wind a bit or something like that. Yeah, thanks so much for your comment. Um, I think that would definitely be something that we could look into and it's definitely, it's definitely a good thought. So yeah, thank you. Um, question, have you researched other CNNs to solve this problem? So um, yes, um, when I started the, working on this project, we had already decided to use YOLO um but after when we were we did conduct some research um on some other cnns that could be used to solve this problem as well um for example there's faster r cnn which is a different type of cnn it's based on a region proposal network which is something that's entirely different than what yolo is using um but of course there are like trade-offs between different ones so some CNNs could be faster and more efficient, but less accurate. Or um, it just some of them have different properties. So um, addressing the next question, why is YOLO the best option for this project? Um, well, as I mentioned in the slide when talking about YOLO, it's considered to be one of the best object detection systems. Um, compared to other ones um, based on accuracy. Um, 
it there are other versions of YOLO, such as Tiny YOLO, that are more efficient. Um, fastest real time detection. Is that a question? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I was trying to say the reason why YOLO is the best option is because it is the fastest real time detection for any CNN that's been out there um, for the last few years since we've been working on this particular problem. And that was the reason why we chose YOLO over some of the other CNNs that might be better at predicting um, or having more accurate results. But the challenge we run into is we want the drone to be thinking and analyzing as it's flying, as well as sending the GPS coordinates to the biologist in real time. Yeah, and there's uh, there are many um, there's basically a family of YOLO products. So the one we're using is YOLO version 4, but there's also a version called Tiny YOLO um, that is definitely a lot more efficient than regular YOLO is, but also has a trade-off between efficiency and accuracy. So um, we are planning to switch to Tiny YOLO in order to integrate it with the drone. Uh, so we'll have to... Um, keep that in mind that the accuracy might decrease uh, when we do that for a trade-off um, in efficiency. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, I'm just going to thank you all for attending this webinar and for listening. And if you want to learn more about KWFF, its projects are for internship opportunities, you can visit the website stated here, KashmirWorldFoundation.org, or email info at KashmirWorldFoundation.org. Um, thank you everyone so much for being here, and thank you for your participation as well.